Okay, welcome everybody. Today is uh, Thursday, February 3rd, it is 6 p.m. This is the Public Safety Committee of the East Hampton City Council. This meeting is being held remotely via Zoom per uh, continuing order of Governor Baker due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome all. I see that our two members, Councillor Derby and Councillor Riley, are both present. Um, we will tonight. We will be discussing the uh, the 2021 annual fire uh, report. Uh, this will also take place. This will be in lieu of uh, the quarterly report from the fire department. Uh, other items that are currently on the agenda are the uh, review, the request to review safety of the South Street Main Street sidewalk, as well as a uh, final report from the Ordinance Review Committee. Um, I would plan to move those to the next meeting, um, unless there's objection from either of the two members. Great. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair? Oh. Yes. I just wanted to, um, the, the South Street item is going to be is something that we're going to have to, it's more of a long term because we have to wait until the springtime for the sidewalk to get finished. So, you know, that, that one's going to probably stay on for a long time. Just, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. As, as you know, I'm new to this committee and honored to be chairing it, but I, I appreciate your uh, uh, institutional knowledge, Councillor Darby. Um, I believe there are no minutes from the last meeting. Um, just as a, a point of order, um, I would ask that uh, um, members, both members of the committee and members of the public when prompted uh, raise their hands to speak. Um, and as the chair, um, I will try to guide everyone through the process as to when it's appropriate for public input, um, input from departments and certainly inputs from members of this committee. Um, at this time, is there uh, public speak time? Are there any members here of the public uh, or other departments who wish to speak on items other than what is on our agenda? Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Seeing none. Our um, item of business for tonight is the 2021 annual report from the fire department. Uh, we had a really spectacular and robust uh, report prepared from uh, Fire Chief Norris. Thank you. Um, I've read through that a few times. Um, there's even a, a picture of me included in it. So thank you, Chief. Um, I was really impressed, I'll just say, with, with the thoroughness of the report. It, it certainly gives a, a really good overview of what's being done in the department. Certainly, we appreciate what the fire department does, as well as our other public safety departments. Um, uh, so Chief Norris forwarded me a PowerPoint, which I'll share momentarily, um, and then I will, um, I'll recognize Chief Norris to provide uh, an overview of uh, the report, um, and then we'll open up to uh, questions and any input from the public. Um, before I turn the floor over to Chief Norris, is there any input from either of the members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, let me just open PowerPoint. Give me one second and figure out how to do this. Uh, Councilor Riley, do you mind if I make you a co-host uh, just to let people in if I need to? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Hold on, just working to share my screen here.
Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? No? Hold on. Let's try this. Okay, can you see that? Great. Let's see. And is it in the slideshow mode now? Can everyone see that? Wonderful. Uh, Chief Norris, the chair recognizes you. If you just let me know when you want me to advance slides. Sure, absolutely. And thank you. And is my audio coming through okay? Great, Chief. All right, excellent. Um, Thank you again, everyone, and thank you for allowing me some time to uh, meet with your committee just to provide you some uh, continual updates. This obviously was one of the goal of um, our department and of mine when I first became chief about a year and a half ago now um, in terms of just trying to continually provide updates to the community and certainly the city leaders as to what the department does um, and what we actually use for resources to provide those services. Um, and then obviously going forward, this certainly is one of the goals I know of Councillor Zarek being the chair as well as a continuation of Councillor Gomez and mine uh, meeting on a quarterly basis. Uh, next slide, please. What I wanted to do tonight was instead of going through obviously page by page of the report um, for the fire department, which can be found on the fire department website, um, I really wanted to just use that as some framework and pull out some of the more highlights um, just to kind of go over and give people and certainly your committee a chance to ask questions. In terms of our department and our overview, um, we have 31 full-time employees. Most of those employees are dispersed over four shifts. Um, each of the four shifts have seven personnel. Um, out of those seven personnel, each shift has one shift captain who's a supervisor of that shift and then six firefighters. And those four shifts rotate um, on a continual basis throughout the week to provide 24 seven coverage to the city and surrounding communities. Um, based on contractual requirements, we have a minimum at all times, a minimum of five firefighters on duty at all times. And based on people being out on vacation, sick, um, injuries, things of that nature, you can understand that that number uh, can fluctuate anywhere between the seven assigned to the shift and then the five person minimum. In addition to the uh, personnel work in the four shifts, there's three staff positions. Um, the fire chief position, the fire prevention captain who oversees all of the code enforcement and inspections, and then the newly created fire training captain position that was implemented this past July. Um, those two positions uh, work four day weeks um, over an average of 40 hours. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is we have one full-time administrative assistant that um, provides a number of great oversight and administrative responsibilities in terms of um, budget oversights, uh, budget development, grants, grants administration, um, certainly does all the scheduling for inspections, as well as updates in our um, uh, records collections as well. Next slide, please. I always like to kind of start off many of my presentations just reminding people just about our overall scope, mission, and responsibilities. And certainly, um, I always recognize uh, fire department organizations as that all hazard response organization. And essentially, what that means is over the years, uh, the departments, fire departments have really evolved to kind of that all encompassing response agency, whether that's fire suppression, which is the traditional role emergency medical services, which certainly takes on a huge aspect of that. But then as you start to get into some of the more complex responses, whether that's through hazardous materials, response and mitigation, um, technical rescues, extrication, motor vehicle accidents, um, on the hazardous materials side of it, we work in conjunction with state response teams and have people assigned to those teams. And also on the technical rescue side of it, we work with state technical rescue teams and have people assigned to those as well. And whether you start building that out even more in terms of environmental challenges and responses through um, floods, 
wind event, snow event. We have an ice event coming in tomorrow. That's where you, re you really start getting into those all hazards response organizations. Next. So looking back now at the calendar year 2021, out of those responsibilities and kind of charges that we have as a fire-based EMA service, what did we actually do? And if you look at the first chart there on the right, and counselors there, I don't know if you can increase the view of that. If we're able to increase the view of that, you can see, perfect, that's much better, thank you. You can see starting on the right-hand side, the overall call volume in 2021 was 3,247 calls. And then it has a broken down into 25 fires, um, some other overheat, overheated and overpressures. Certainly EMS takes up a huge volume of our responses. Um, most years that runs around 80%. Certainly you can see right here, this was just under 80% with 2,591 calls. And then you can see a bunch of other categories with miscellaneous responses throughout the year for the overall total. And then on the left-hand side, you can see just based on that pie chart, um, certainly the orange uh, component there uh, just gives you that pictorial view of the overall EMS uh, call volume uh, in regards to, in relation to the overall call volume for our organization. Next slide, please. So just starting to look at some trends and, and how year-to-year -year comparisons um, look. I, I went back five years and you can see on the left-hand chart there, just looking back and some of the significant increases in overall call volume from 2017 to 2856 to uh, 2021 with the 3247. Um, you see a little dip there in 2019, 2020. Um, people kind of have always asked, you know, what, what are some of the reasons behind that? And certainly COVID did play a response uh, in those uh, drops in call volume. At that time, as many people are aware, people were nervous to call 911 because they didn't want to go to the hospital. People were unsure of a lot of things. Um, so that certainly led to a little bit of a dip and decline during those couple of years. And then as you look at the chart on the right-hand side, the days a week, um, that's just informational purposes only um, in terms of how do the calls stack up and relate throughout the week. As you can see, it's pretty consistent um, across the board, uh, no matter what day of the week it is. Next slide, please. In addition to all the emergency responses, um, we really have looked at trying to make significant gains in our training of our personnel. And we've done that in a number of different ways. Um, we've done it both on duty and off duty, trying to balance uh, the other responsibilities uh, and demands throughout um, the, the, shift, uh, the shift schedules. In addition to doing the on duty and off duty training, we really have tried to emphasize our officer development program and training. Um, when I came in a year and a half ago, um, there was, um, what one of my goals was to make sure in terms of succession planning that we were able to develop our officers and give them the ability to promote up and advance in their careers. And we've continued that through today, sending them to classes both at the State Academy, the National Fire Academy, um, sending them to incident command training courses just to continue to develop their scope of training um, and responsibilities within the department. One of the things um, that has come out of COVID is um, the greater use of online and remote learning. And we certainly have leveraged that to our advantage to um, get more people during their on-duty shifts training and doing that on the computer. We, we increased all of our capabilities for hardware in terms of computer and technology. Um, typically, I'll send out at least one assignment on a monthly basis. So during any times in between re, uh, their normal shift training and emergency responses, they'll be responsible for completing that online training at some point by the end of the month. This training encompasses both fire and EMS. I keep on reminding people as one of my themes that we are a fire-based EMS service, 
And I just need to make sure people re remember that and understand that, trying to balance the needs of both services um, that are required throughout the community. So we have uh, both aspects of that training. Um, one of the things, one of the challenges that I first kind of was able to um, look at is the need for training coverage. And what I mean by that is if I use this past week as an example, we did ice rescue out on the pond. And that is one of those, what I term low frequency, high risk training evolutions, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. But the challenge trying to do that on duty shift training is I can't have those five, six or seven people that are assigned for the day out in the middle of a pond and then an ambulance call or a fire comes in and now everyone's scrambling as a delayed response. So what we've done is we've tried to manage and balance, bring in two people back they're in some of these uh, company level training evolutions, because we obviously realized through data, data analysis that the highest probability of a call coming in is gonna be EMS related. So by bringing two people in during those training hours, just to cover that first ambulance call, then allows those groups to focus on their training, actually complete the training and not get pulled away and have that delayed response. And then the last one there is, I've, I've talked to the mayor about this extensively, is the need for the ongoing live fire training. And again, just using that low frequency, high risk, it certainly heightens the need to focus training in these areas. I need to make sure in the event we have a fire, which just occurred last week, that all of these firefighters are competent, safe, and can effectively perform their duties on the fire ground. And through that, one of the goals of the mayor and mine certainly was providing at least two live fire training evolutions per year, just to maintain those skills and that skill set um, with all the individuals and all the firefighters. And as you look at that five year trend, again, just kind of going back and looking at it, um, we certainly have tried to improve and make significant strides, both on duty and off duty, off duty with our overall training hours as an organization. Next slide, please. Some other ancillary functions that we have, certainly not minimized um, by the emergency responses, but um, community risk reduction. And essentially what, what that means is fire prevention and code enforcement. And we have one full-time individual um, at the captain level assigned to this full-time. And then uh, that position supplemented currently um, by other areas of the department to assist with a lot of these inspections. You can see a number of those inspections on the left-hand side there. Um, I certainly could have tripled the bullet points on that side of the slide, but obviously just for ease of um, seeing some of the highlights there, I, I put the most common ones in the left. And then again, looking back at that three-year trend um, from 2019 to just this past year, you can see the greater demand, um, both within that community risk reduction and fire prevention division um, that has uh, been completed over just the past two years alone. Um, some of the challenges this year, obviously the, the new school certainly stands out, working with the contractors and making sure they met all the current codes for that. Um, we're constantly getting smoke and carbon monoxide um, inspection requests, particularly based on the requirement for state law for resale of homes. And then probably the other most common one out there are the oil burners and propanes. Um, so that just gives you kind of a quick snapshot of some of the uh, areas responsible for fire prevention. Next slide, please. We always get questions on mutual aid. And with mutual aid, um, there's a statewide agreement through the Mass Emergency Management Agency for all communities have the ability to enter into this. And mutual aid is, is just what it sounds like. It's reciprocal in nature. And looking at the 2021 statistics right there, you can see that we've given 421 calls for mutual aid and have received it 53 times. Um, those numbers are a little bit skewed based on the West Hampton um, contract, which I'll talk about in a minute, those get categorized as mutual aid, but in reality, they are primary responses for us. 
um, because of the contract. Um, other areas that we provide uh, mutual aid to, um, City Northampton's a common one, and then also Southampton and Holyoke. And then most of those mutual aid calls are typically for EMS, but we also have the fire agreements as well. And then on the right-hand side, um, I really keep track of this and focus on this, is the concurrent calls, those overlapping calls. And the reason I really try to focus on this, I'll, I'll go back to some of my opening statements, is that part of our mission, our mission is fire-based EMS and providing both those services. And the challenge that we're just monitoring and try to make sure we maintain is that proper protection um, and coverage for the city for both fire and EMS. And with a minimum of five people on duty, you look at those overlapping calls right there, and it's roughly 28 to 30% on a regular basis. So if I've got at least two calls going on at the same time, and they're probably EMS related, I know that at a minimum, each of those calls have two people on those ambulances. So just backing out two for each ambulance, now I'm left with one firefighter providing fire protection to the city of East Hampton, or I'm unable to provide and staff that third ambulance requiring the need to provide mutual aid into the city. Next call, please. Uh, I'm sorry, next uh, slide, please. So EMS, what do we do? What do we have? With our EMS responses, we have three ambulances. They are all licensed at the paramedic level. That paramedic level is the highest level pre-hospitally uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Um, the state comes in at a minimum once a year and inspects the ambulances to make sure they're compliant with all the regulation, regulations and requirements, um, equipment. They look at our training records. They look at our personnel records, um, all of our administrative procedures, our policies um, to make sure they meet those minimum requirements. Um, West Hampton. Um, Back about, it was two years ago now, right before I started, um, the city of East Hampton signed a three-year contract with the town of West Hampton. And essentially that contract is to provide all of the EMS services to the town of West Hampton. Uh, that contract ends June of 2023. And over that three-year period, um, every July, the city of East Hampton sends an invoice to the town of West Hampton for $25,000. And I usually term that $25,000 as a retainer fee. And that retainer fee um, is basically the uh, part of the contract that says, okay, we understand you're gonna provide these services. And when a call comes in to the town of West Hampton, our ambulance respond out there with the personnel and then in addition to the 25,000, we have the ability to also bill the insurance company if a patient is transported. Um, I can share with you, I know last fiscal year when I ran all the analysis and data for that contract, we, we collected um, just over $59,000 for last fiscal year, just for the calls out to West Hampton. All transports are able to be billed um, to the insurance company. And then all the money for all the collections for that retainer fee to West Hampton, all the collections for um, insurance companies all goes to the general fund. And then looking at the pie chart on the right-hand side, um, you can see the breakdown that the areas that we go to. And we've got it broken down to obviously East Hampton is 86% 80, of our call volume. West Hampton is 5%. We went to West Hampton, and again, these are calendar year numbers. We went to West Hampton 116 times. We went to South Hampton as the primary response. That, meaning they had, that means they had no ambulance available 83 times. We went to Holyoke as their primary response 50 times. We went to North Hampton as their primary response 47 times. And then we went to South Hampton for an emergency intercept. That means an intercept is they had an ambulance available and they responded, but they needed a higher level of service at the paramedic level and their ambulance was staffed at a basic level. So we went for an emergency intercept to Southampton 41 times and Holyoke for an intercept four times. 
So again, that kind of gives you a very detailed breakdown in terms of EMS as to where we went for the calendar year. Next slide, please. Some more on EMS overview. Again, just in terms of data analysis and helping to drive and manage and make some decisions. Um, looking at the chart on the left, um, this chart shows a breakdown of the um, demographics for age for all the people that we responded. And looking at this, um, you can see that almost 50% of the EMS calls we went to were for individuals age 65 or older. And then the other one that kind of I pulled out of this trying to um, help gauge and um, determine how to um, do the training for this coming year is I looked at the calls for the pediatrics. And I, obviously in the state of Massachusetts, anyone under the age of 18 is considered a minor. But looking at these numbers right here, if I just use, if I use uh, the child between six and 11, the toddlers between one and three, the preschoolers and infants, we did about 50 calls last year for those age groups combined. And I share that with you out of importance because, again, you know, when I try to frame our training and our training requirements, those are those low frequency, high risk calls. And if we have a pediatric call who is choking, who is in cardiac arrest, children typically, um, I'm sure counselors there are aware of this, children uh, typically have respiratory um, compromise and respiratory issues. I want to make sure through training and um, experience that these individuals know what to do based on the state protocols. So what we've done the past two years now is offer um, through the American Heart Association what they call a pediatric advanced life support class. And it focuses on these age groups and what's required and the treatments needed and the therapies needed in the event of emergency. And then the last chart there on the screen shows you the hospitals and the breakdown as to where we actually transport all these patients. Um, of interest for this one, uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, obviously that's our, that's our main hospital. Um, we go there more than 50% um, of the time. But of interest is looking at Bay State Medical Center and Mercy Medical Center. Uh, we went to Bay State 329 times and we went to Mercy Medical Center 23 times. And again, trying to use this data to ensure we have the best coverage for the city of East Hampton, one of the challenges is, especially through COVID, not only do both of these healthcare facilities require longer transport times, but obviously based on the demand for their services, when we transport down there, um, we're out of service for the longer time because of many of the other services that are also down there. I've received in the last month emails from a few hospitals outlining the ongoing demands they have seen for um, wait times in their ambulance services. And again, the thing I always share with people is when we transport a patient in the ambulance, people sometimes forget that we lose two people for a minimum of an hour. And then you start going to Mercy and Bay State you can plan being them having them gone for up to an hour and a half based on the, the um, severity of the call, based on the further transport time, and based on the wait times at some of these healthcare facilities. So through that, trying to manage that, we have implemented a um, different callback system to try to backfill those people who are gone for those longer periods of time to maintain adequate coverage for the city for both fire and EMS protection. Next slide, please. So in terms of all of this and EMS revenue, so as I mentioned, um, all this revenue um, goes to the city general fund. When you have the West Hampton contract, I mentioned that is uh, right out of the gate initially, the $25,000 retainer fee of July 1st. And then in addition to that, um, the calls that we're able to transport, we can build the insurance company. Um, no matter what community we go to, whether it's East Hampton or the surrounding communities, if we, uh, we can uh, bill any insurance company for patient care transports. The other kind of the three-tiered approach, in addition to the contract and in addition to the patient care transports, the Medicare Certified Public, Public Expenditures Program. Uh, 
So in the city of East Hampton, when you look at those people that we transport and what they call the payer mix, the payer mix in East Hampton is 75% Medicare, Medicaid, and then 25% private insurance. And as many people are aware, no matter what you submit for a bill for services to Medicare, Medicaid, what they have for their rates is what you're going to get. So Medicare obviously understands this, and they also understand that what they reimburse communities for their services probably isn't what they actually expend. So every year, communities who, um, communities who get involved in this program have the ability to submit all of their call volume, all of their revenue that they've collected, all of their um, billing for Medicare patients. They run their analysis and their calculations. And then typically around May or June, they give communities a little bit more money to help offset some of those expenses. Um, to give you an example, last fiscal year, we received an additional $80,000 based on these calculations and analysis that they ran with the understanding that what we received throughout the year didn't cover our cost. So they gave us, based on our documentation, 80,000 more. And then uh, looking at the projections for this year, I just ran these the other day. Um, right now with the West Hampton contract, with our call volume and our increased call volume and the revenue projected currently for this certified public expenditure program, we're looking at projections of over 1 million for this fiscal year we're in. You can see the chart on the right-hand side, um, the revenue overview for the last 10 years. Um, that last call in 2021, last year we collected $913,000. Um, so we're slowly, uh, uh, slowly making uh, some small increases there. Next slide, please. In addition to the revenue um, that's being generated through EMS services, um, we've always been um, very aggressive in looking at different grant and grant options. Um, looking at the chart on the right to start with, in terms of uh, calendar year 2021, we were um, pretty successful in some federal and state grants. Um, we received the Assistance of Firefighters Grant, the AFG, for all new hoes. Um, that has been ordered. We should be taking delivery of that um, later this spring for just under $20,000. We received the Assistance of Firefighters Grant for the new ambulance for $275,000. And then um, working with the mayor and her financial team, um, we were able to work with the vendors and in terms of purchasing um, two ambulances at the same time, able to drive down the price and get uh, two ambulances that are currently on order. And they should be delivered, um, we're hoping, um, by December. Um, through the state grant, Department of Fire Services, last year we received $15,000 for from ancillary equipment and supplies. Um, the EMPG grant, the Emergency Management Preparedness Grant, that's a state um, emergency management grant. We're able to outfit some of our firefighters with compliant personal protective equipment, some PPE. The senior, uh, the senior Safe uh, and Safe Education in Schools grant, we received $6,100 for ongoing education outreach there. And then FM Global, um, it's one of those private grants that we were able to um, successfully obtain. We just received over $3,000 for the purchase of portable lights for a total of just over $323,000 last year. Um, on the left-hand side, just looking at some of the bullets that are pending out there right now, we submitted back in November a grant for $97,000 for a new Cascade air fill-in station. That fill-in station will be used to fill our SCBA bottles, our self-contained breathing apparatus bottles. That current unit is on our capital plan right now. And without having it in front of me, I think that current unit was manufactured in 1985, I believe. So it certainly needs updated and uh, replaced. Um, we also have a grant pending out there for new brush truck. Um, that is for $295,000. The brush truck that we currently are using is a 1985. Um, it is a vehicle that's a converted vehicle that's being utilized for purposes it was not intended or designed. 
And in fact, it was given to the city of East Hampton by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, so when we are successful with that grant, um, that will actually go back to DCR um, and they'll obviously probably surplus that at that time. And then the last one that's currently out there is I, I need to submit this one in two weeks. It will be for $45,000. It's a fire education and prevention grant. Um, this grant, the scope of this grant will be continual outreach. Um, today, uh, over the last three months and today, um, we've been working with the American Red Cross and throughout the community putting in smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. Um, that grant will continue that outreach effort as well as um, give us the ability to uh, potentially um, procure a new LED sign for the front of the public safety complex that can be used for community messaging and outreach and education, um, change your clock, check your batteries, um, wear your seatbelts, things of that nature. Um, putting that right out by the light pole so it would be seen both by the road traffic and also the bike path. Next uh, slide, please. And then as we wind down, um, obviously we, we certainly always have our goals. We certainly always have room for improvement. And just looking at some of the um, um, ones we're really focusing on for 2022 is number one, just maintaining the safety of our personnel, minimizing the potential for injuries. I, I can't say enough, I'm so proud of all the personnel at East Hampton Fire, the services they provide, um, and, and particularly through COVID. Um, they, they have certainly met and exceeded all the challenges, um, have not wavered at all, and continually uh, go above and beyond. Um, when they get called for um, these patients uh, in the community and around the region um, who are COVID positive, um, they go there, they provide the excellent treatment. Um, they're in the back of a five by six ambulance with COVID positive patients and um, they do exceptional, exceptional work. And um, to, to continue to make sure they have the proper equipment and gear um, and training to provide those services certainly will always continue to be my uh, number one priority. Um, I talked about grants. Um, I, I am a huge proponent of grants and outside funding. Um, I, I certainly, I like the competitive nature of it. It certainly makes it more challenging, especially when you're competing for vehicles across the country where they typically only work 200 a year. Um, but we'll certainly continue to be aggressive with that. The use of technology, um, we've made excellent strides with technology. One of the things we're very proud of right now ongoing is the use of the city website and the fire department website for issuing brush burning permits. Before the old system, people would have to either come in or call the um, dispatch center. And obviously with their limited resources and staff, and that took up extra time, we're now utilizing technology. They can log on at their convenience, take out the permit, um, and it, it's so simple and easy. Um, the department, the personnel department have done an exceptional job with public outreach and education. Again, whether it's uh, them out there doing smoke detector and carbon monoxide installations today, they're in the schools for the next few weeks, assisting the school nurses with uh, COVID testing. We're doing a vaccine clinic with uh, Bree and her staff and the Board of Health and the schools, um, March, uh, I'm sorry, February 16th and March 6th. Um, so that is certainly gonna continue to be a priority. Um, I talked about the new ambulances and putting those in service. Um, Department of Communications in terms of our infrastructure for both mobile and portable radios. Um, this one here, I, I can't stress enough, and, and we'll certainly have more ongoing uh, conversations about this moving forward, but um, the communication infrastructure um, in East Hampton um, is very um, limited at best. I, I'll use the example when uh, we go to 391 Main Street for an ambulance call and they get inside that building, the dispatch center cannot hear them up at 391 Main Street um, at all from the dispatch center. That's a problem. Um, it's a significant problem. And on our end, we're trying to continually capture some data, capture some more um, statistics to then come up with a plan as to how to kind of tackle that challenge. And then the last one is just um, improving the overall fire coverage to the city and reduce the number of hours times the city is with limited fire protection response. Again, trying to find that balance, um, being that we're a fire EMS-based service, 
um, we can't lose sight of the fact as a community that we need to make sure we have adequate resources to deliver both uh, services as expected in the community. Next slide, please. So I'll stop there. I've gone on for about a half hour now. I wanted to make sure that I left plenty of time for questions or comments. Um, and I certainly just wanna be respectful of all your time and, and not talk too long tonight. Um, so I'll pause there, Councillor Zaret, and open it up for uh, questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, first of all, that was a spectacular presentation. Um, certainly uh, goes well in concert with the um, the report that you put together and the high level of work that we've come to expect from the East Hampton Fire Department is certainly exemplified by the time and effort you put into this presentation. So thank you. I uh, just want to outline the next steps here in the meeting. Uh, in a moment, I'll open it up to the members of the committee for questions. We'll go uh, one question per counselor at a time, just for the sake of equity, and we'll make our way around. Um, but seeing that there are some members here, the public and the department, I just wanted to give a brief moment uh, to open uh, up the, um, the forum for comments. Uh, please direct them to the committee and the committee members can also then choose to use their time to relay any potential questions to the chief. But I see a few members of the public uh, uh, of the city and certainly some fine members of our fire department. So if anyone wants to make any comments at this time, uh, please use the raise your raise hand feature. Okay, seeing none. And again, thank you to the fine members of our fire department um, for all the work you do. Uh, at this time, in no particular order, uh, Councillor Derby, I'll start with you if you have a question to ask the chief. Um, I guess not so much of a question. I, I think I'm just appreciative of this information. Uh, I'm appreciative of the work that you guys are doing and the progress that we're making. I, 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 you answered the one question I had, um, which is about the brush truck, because I knew that our brush truck was a hand-me-down from uh, DCR. And I know that as uh, climate change is going to continue to impact us and we have all that um, brush that's still down on Mount Tom, um, you know, this is something that has been concerning me. I want to make sure that, you know, that's on the radar. It seems like it is. So that's great. I guess, um, I guess the only other question I would have is, um, I, you know, I saw you guys training on the, on the pond. I wish I could have been there, but I was at work. Um, you know, as far as our access to the river and the oxbow, I know that that is a potential uh, spot for response, emergency response. And um, do you feel like you have the resources that you need to be able to do water rescues on the oxbow and be able to get into our section of the Connecticut River? Um, and I imagine mutual aid would, would play into that as well. So I guess maybe that would be my question. Yes, no, thank you for that. And I guess I'll start with in terms of the equipment, um, the department has made some significant gains in equipment and resources for water and ice rescue. We've got the four new ice rescue suits, which we obtained on a grant. We received a new rescue board and ropes and other ancillary equipment we received on a grant. Um, in terms of access um, to the Oxbow in particular, um, that certainly, as you mentioned and alluded to, would be a joint effort with the Northampton Fire Department. And probably um, between... Um, um, the access over on Mount Tom Road would be one, and then also over off of Fort Hill would be probably another one we could access. But certainly, depending on where the incident occurred, those would be probably the two primary deployment points for those areas. I think one area, Councilor Derby, that I'd love to have further discussion on, and we were just talking about this uh, yesterday with our training on uh, the pond across from uh, City Hall, is an access point right off of Wilson Avenue for a boat. Um, right now, we have to go to the other side of the pond to access that, and that certainly delays a lot of our responses. I think down the road, I'd love to talk to the uh, Conservation Commission, the Planning Commission, and see if we have the ability to per, put a emergency access ramp in off of the Wilson Avenue side to help expedite responses that would require a boat um, anywhere in the pond, because by going around with a trailer and backing it in, um, you certainly, I, I would say before anyone, you're adding significant minutes to that type of response. Um, 
so that that certainly would be a concern for that pond there. Um, so I hope I answered your question, sir. Absolutely. Thanks very much. That's a great question, Councillor Derby. I didn't even think about our role um, on the Oxbow. So thank you for for bringing that up, uh, Councillor Riley. Any question for you? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to also say thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, I I think that there was so much information in there, things that I wouldn't have even thought to ask about. So um, I wanted to um, thank you for providing so much of that for us um, this evening. So. Uh, the question that I had specifically was um, in relation to the, um, you know, communication blind spots that are happening um, throughout different areas of East Hampton. Has the um, fire department done any um, exploratory work on what a potential solution would be to have 100% area coverage, um, as in like the technology that you would need, or, you know, would it be possible to um, you know, have that kind of equipment up on the top of Mount Tom to provide full coverage. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of how you respond to calls, um, you know, you're, you're probably not knowing the full scope of what's actually going on until you actually get inside of someone's property. Um, and I could see how, you know, losing contact with dispatch is a potentially dangerous situation for members of the public, but also for uh, members of the fire department. So I guess if you could just uh, give me an update on wh what you think that possible solution would look like and what we could do to help you um, make that come to fruition. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so communication certainly is a multifaceted problem. And what I mean by that is not only is communications challenging and challenging in terms of where we are geographically throughout the community. It's also compounded by the fact of what type of structure and location we are within a building. So for example, um, and I gotta give a uh, huge credit to Captain Dan Constantine for this, the new uh, school building. When they built that and they did initial uh, propagation studies and radio tests for that building, what they found is they were gonna have zero um, communication abilities with our portable radios in that new facility based on the location and also the structure itself and the building components of that structure. So what they did was to help overcome that, they basically put what they call BDA. It's basically an antenna right inside the building. They put one for not only fire, but we also had them put one for police. Um, Dan Constantine coordinated all of that. So now anytime we're in that building there, it goes directly to the antenna inside that building um, because of the components and structures, uh, the components that structure is made with. Um, the other uh, a part to your question was, have, what have we done in terms of trying to identify other solutions? Right now, I have already talked with the city of Holyoke. Um, Holyoke Gas and Electric has a tower on Mount Tom. Um, I've talked with them. We have uh, initial approval if we want to possibly use that. We are looking into, okay, we've got their approval, but will, will it be allowed by the um, Federal Communications Commission? Because now that we go up to that location at that height, would our frequencies then interfere with other communities south of us that are on the same frequencies? So they're going to wait until springtime when the leaves come out on the trees, which, believe it or not, impact um, frequencies and wavelengths to do some further studies. And, and I guess the final component to that is, and I, I want to make sure we keep, I'll keep this on the radar, is as, as much as I want to address this and address it quickly, I also want to be careful not to use a Band-Aid approach. Um, I want to make sure that what we do is um, comprehensive and will last the city for the next 20 years. Um, there's certainly different systems out there. They have voter systems, which is basically multiple spots. You can put antennas through a community. When the firefighters key up their portable radio, it picks the best site that these antennas are at and will use just that one site while it shuts off the other ones to improve communications. Um, that may be a better system than putting a repeater over Mount Tom. Um, ultimately, I, I think one of the things I, I want to continue to uh, 
talk with the mayor about, and certainly your committee, is would it be beneficial long term to bring in a consultant and have them do a comprehensive study for the city and not only the fire department, but all services and what would work best long term? And what do we need to purchase to make that happen? Once we get that information, then set us free and look at grant, grant and other funding opportunities. So I, I, I'm sure I, I hope I answered your question. I'm sure I kind of uh, rambled on about a lot of other things, but it's certainly one of the things that I am very passionate about. And when you look at firefighter fatalities across this country, um, after the investigations are complete, um, communications have always, unfortunately, played some role in it and the lack thereof. And I, I, I can't let that happen here to our members. I, I, I can't. Yeah, thank uh, you so much for your answer. Excellent question I, uh, and, and uh, really thought-provoking response too, Chief. Thank you. Uh, that gives me pause to think about, uh, I think the potential for a citywide evaluation is something to look into for sure. Um, I have a couple questions, but uh, starting with call volume um, and uh, which also involves um, mutual aid, uh, it mostly aid given in this case, and then leading to um, overlapping calls. And certainly I'm sure the, the West Hampton contracts tied up in this. So we're seeing an upward trend in call volume, uh, which is, I'm sure, leading to an increase in overlapping calls. Um, how do you foresee, or what what would you foresee as a potential solution? I'm assuming that we'll, we kind, you kind of get to uh, kind of a breaking point or uh, at some point where the percentage of overlapping calls necessitates some sort of action in terms of staffing. Um, so what what are your what are your thoughts around where we're heading in that in that specific scenario? No, thank thank you for that call. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of the call volume, uh, Councilor Rosera, you, you're absolutely correct. Is that that's the challenge? That's the balance. And, and I keep on coming back to uh, over the course of the last what I'll say just anecdotally ten to fifteen years, the city has kind of lost that balance of fire and EMS protection. And what I mean by that, as the, the demand for EMS has continually increased as the data is showing, the resources that were initially there on the fire side have been kind of taken and utilized on the EMS side. And in the short term, over the last 18 months, what I've tried to do to maintain that balance, and in particular, given the challenges of COVID and increased uh, wait times, is we've changed around our callback procedures. So right now, when an ambulance transfers a patient to any hospital other than Cooley Dickinson and Hoyoke, I look at Cooley Dickinson Hospital and Hoyoke Hospital as kind of still in our service zone. But when you start going to Springfield, to Bay State, uh, Mercy Medical Center, we go a couple of times to Noble, um, that has that extended out of service time with a minimum of two firefighters. So the dispatchers have a policy based on my direction. Anytime an ambulance goes to those other healthcare facilities, we're calling back for two firefighters to backfill for that coverage. Um, and, and then certainly with five people on shift right now, we don't even have enough firefighters right there to staff all, of our, all three of our ambulances. Um, so that certainly is a problem. And, and then I think the last example I'll, I'll share with you is, again, in terms of the theory of recency, we had that fire last week. We had five people on duty. We had two ambulances out at the time that fire came in. And we had one person left in the station who was on shift to respond to that. Now, we got lucky for this instance. I made the comments earlier that we brought people back. We've been bringing people back for coverage during training. Those two people were walking in the door to provide that training coverage when that call came in. So by sheer luck, we had three people on our engine responding because of that training coverage. Otherwise, we would have had one person responding to a fire. 
and, and certainly um, at a later time when there's more time, we can talk uh, about that. But I guess in the short term, to answer your question, um, right now we're relying on callback. That is not reliable. Um, it, it's not the way to run a professional organization. Um, so we certainly need to um, look at other options. Um, I started preliminary discussions with the mayor and her financial team, um, but we need to balance that fire and EMS protection and not lose sight of the fact that fire protection is one of the critical missions of our organization. Great, thank you, Chief. Councilor Derby, do you have another question? Nope. Councilor Riley. Uh, uh, just to uh, so make I, I think really, oh, no. uh, ahead, I would just sorry. say the, uh, the last question that I have is um, in terms of practicing on uh, active fires, um, could you just kind of walk me through a little bit of what that process looks like to set a training like that up? And, um, you know, what can members of the city council do to um, encourage that kind of training? Because it's, it's clear how vital that training is to do. Um, so that way, you know, people aren't just going into fires um, without constant training. So uh, any insight you can give, that would be great. Absolutely. And you certainly have uh, touched on one of my passions. I, I love training. Um, in my role with the State Fire Academy, um, I, I'm very blessed and fortunate to have a number of different resources. So with that, what I can share with you right now is on April 20th and 21st, we already have scheduled coming directly to the city of East Hampton, just like we did last year, one of their mobile live fire training props. Um, last year, I think Councilor Zara, you were able to attend one of those. The mayor was able to attend one of those days. Um, I certainly am always open and willing to offer up to any city councilors to come by for those. And what those mobile live fire training props, props allow us to do is to not only capture the on-duty crew, um, but also I can capture some of the off-duty crew as well to maintain the coverage as calls come in throughout the day. Um, and then we can also bring in our mutual aid partners to practice with us as well. Then in addition to that, what we also have already reserved, the first Saturday in June, the city of East Hampton has the Springfield Burn Building, which is actually owned by the Department of Fire Services. We have that reserved for our department. So again, that would entail um, a more focused um, objective of moving hose lines and advancing the hose lines through an entire structure compared to the mobile training props work on more fire suppression techniques. Um, so those are two um, examples that we already have lined up and scheduled, um, both to allow on-duty people to do it and off-duty people um, with a mix of fire suppression and also hose operations. And then also the ability to work with our surrounding communities who, who partner with us on these fires as well. On that fire last week, um, Northampton and Southampton both came in to assist us. Thank you, Chief. And those live fire demonstrations are really cool to see. So I definitely encourage any counselors who have an opportunity to um, to attend to attend one, and I hope to attend one again soon uh, when you when you have those available. Um, and also, just a brief thank you, Chief, for returning our city counselors um, in one piece uh, from the uh, the the ice exercise. Um, uh, just a, mostly a quick question about revenue. Um, obviously the West Hampton contract, both via the, the retainer fee of $25,000 and, and the close to, I, I believe you said close to $60,000 in, um, um, in revenue from, um, from ambulance calls. Um, you know, we're nearing a million dollars in revenue to the general fund. Um, it, to, it, I wonder are there any models that you've seen in other cities? You know, certainly th in this case, uh, fire EMS is clearly a revenue driver, but they're also, uh, they require um, appropriations frequently. Um, and it begs the question if there's models out there that other cities use to drive at least some um, EMS revenue into like a retainer fund or a, um, uh, some sort of uh, revolving fund where uh, it makes it easier for fire to access money when they when they need it, especially in the case of equipment, because you also go through a lot of equipment. The more calls, the more equipment supplies are needed. 
um, and to decrease the need for the council to have to make appropriations. Um, just any quick thoughts or comments on that? So, so what I'll share with you is uh, the most recent example, and, and I, I had the company send me an email on this just so I'd have it in writing from them. COVID has has done um, has created a, a number of financial challenges um, in, in all different agencies and services. And when you look at EMS, um, I reached out to the company we get medical supplies from, Boundary Medical Services. And what I asked them was, was a simple question, was can you please provide me um, the cost in 2019 pre-COVID for a case of gloves and then provide me that same equipment for that same case of gloves in today's dollars? And back in 2019, that case of gloves, a case being 10 boxes, was $60. That same case today, $260. And that's just one example. Um, of the equipment that we're going through, which then again drives the increased need for um, um, expenditures on supplies and equipment. In, in terms of your question about different models, certainly there's different models out there. Um, I, I've seen models across the country where um, many departments will run like ours, where the money goes back to the general fund. Um, and then there's other models where they may set up what they call an EMS reserve receipt account, where the money comes back to a dedicated account, and then those funds are used to offset the operating expenditures for providing that service. Um, I've, I've operated in both types of systems. Um, ultimately, um, I, I, think, I think it's always a challenge trying to figure out what's best for the community. And, and certainly the mayor and the city council has been extremely supportive um, in terms of our needs, our equipments, our supplies, um, other, other options, yes, because I don't have the full big picture of the city finances. Um, I'm not sure specifically for East Hampton what will work best, um, but I'm, I'm certainly appreciative of all the support financially. Um, we have a request in right now. We meet with finance committee next week, and I'll be walking them through some reasons as to as to the why. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I don't have a good answer to that question quite yet, Councilor Zarek. No, thank you, Chief. Um, Councilor Derby, anything else? Oh. Councilor Riley. No, I, I think everything's been very um, clear and organized, and I appreciate everything that you've offered to us tonight. Thank you. No, th thank you. And certainly I'd be remiss if um, in, in closing tonight, um, I, I sent out uh, to the full council on April 28th, we'll be doing another what we, we call a city school. Um, and and I, I highly encourage, I, I would please highly encourage everyone to uh, save that date. And the whole purpose of that is number one, get all, give all, all of us together, show you what we do, what equipment we use, um, and the reasons why we need it. Um, and, and we try to make it a fun night. We try to make it a hands-on experience, give the counselors a chance to use the extrication equipment, put on our gear and equipment, um, and better understand um, what we actually do. And it's important because you guys are the city leaders. So uh, I, I'd uh, greatly ask you save that date. Thank you, Chief, and that's a great initiative uh, brought forward um, by you in concert with uh, uh, um, Councilor Gomez. Um, really quickly, too, you had um, addressed uh, a couple places in the report, and certainly at the summary, um, you, it, it looks like you're considering um, asking at least to reopen a deputy chief position. You had mentioned some potential roles for that position. Is that something you can comment on, or...? Yeah, it's something that, you know, I've been in conversations with the mayor and her financial team in regards to looking at different options, different funding sources. Um, I guess in terms of where it is right now, is there a need for it? Absolutely. Um, why do we need it? The job description I have in draft format right now um, really focuses on the EMS aspect. When you have a business and 80% of that business is uh, EMS related, and you look at all the financials, all the revenue, all the expenditures, all the personnel, all the training, the equipment, the oversight, 
Um, you really need a chief officer to help oversee that. And then also, um, if I've mentioned COVID a few times tonight, if COVID hasn't, um, if COVID has done anything, it has really exposed some of the vulnerabilities of agencies and organizations. And what I mean by that is in terms of succession planning, right now, East Hampton Fire has no clear number two person in charge. Um, we have the fire chief position and then six captains. And just in terms of continuity of operations, in terms of succession planning, and in terms of a uh, good business model, we really need to look at different options of how to get that deputy fire chief position filled uh, sooner rather than later. Great, thank you, Chief. And, and thank you again for, for coming tonight and the very thorough report and presentation tonight. We truly appreciate all you and your department do. Um, anything further from either of the members of the committee? No, just thanks very much, Chief. Okay, seeing nothing else, um, we already uh, mentioned that we'll address the other items on the agenda at a future meeting. Um, it looks like as of right now, counselors, that uh, Tuesday, March 1st would be our, our next scheduled meeting. Does that date work for uh, both of you? It does. like it would work for me. Great. Okay. So we'll plan on that uh, at uh, 6 p.m. in these chambers, as it were. Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. We have a motion from Councilor Derby, a second from Councilor Riley. Uh, I will take a uh, vote. Councilor Derby? Yes. Councilor Riley? Aye. And I am also an I. This meeting of the East Hampton City Council uh, Public Safety Committee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and have a Thank good you. night. Stay safe. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Chief.